Hello folks and welcome to my review of the Toyota RAV4 plug-in hybrid. Now the standard RAV4 starts at about 34 grand but this plug-in hybrid version is about 46 in dynamic spec as we have here. So this car gives you that very familiar two and a half litre Toyota power plant and of course that plug-in hybrid technology which helps propel this car to a 0-62 time of six seconds. Now the exterior design can be a bit polarizing with the RAV4 but for me, it ticks one major box, which is, is it, it's interesting. People do tend to love it or hate it, which must mean it's doing something in terms of design in a world full of very, very bland looking cars. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments. Now, a lot of plug-in hybrid vehicles suffer with something I call small boot syndrome, which is where they lose a ton of their boot space because of the fact that they've got the batteries and the EV technology as well as the internal combustion engine. That's not the case in this one. It's still got a very respectable boot. If we pop this load cover back, you'll find 520 litres of boot space here. You've got a nice little cubby there to store your charging cables, and it's a brilliant shape for getting large items in and out. It really is a well-designed boot space. It's a really nicely laid out cabin, lovely steering wheel. Everything just feels like very good quality and it feels like it's built to last, as you might expect in a Toyota. Great to have buttons, knobs, dials to control the air conditioning system. Very, very nice quality, very heavily rubberized. Controls for heated seats here. Um, we've got an inductive charging pad in this car and your USB and a 12 volt down there. Now the infotainment system is a bit of a letdown. Luckily you have got Apple CarPlay and Apple CarPlay responds fairly snappily with this system. Uh, you've got perfect amount of real estate. So there are no issues with using Apple CarPlay with this car or indeed Android Auto. When it comes to using the car's inbuilt infotainment system, the maps are just very 2003. The menus, although easy enough to use, they just look from a different era, if we're being fair, don't they? Luckily, we've seen the new Toyota system on the BZ4X. Hopefully, it will get rolled out across the range before too long. As I said, it's not the end of the world by any means. You can use Apple CarPlay, you can use Android Auto. Better infotainment system in this car would really give the car a very different and much more modern feel. Folks, how's this for timing? I'm just editing this video right now, and Toyota have just announced that the 2023 RAV4 is going to get a big multimedia upgrade. You'll see a new screen for both the infotainment system and the driver information display, and it really does seem like a huge upgrade from what's in the car at the moment. Now, although some of the cabin materials are a bit hard, especially down here, here, and here they feel like they're built to last i'm sure this car will feel exactly the same in 10 years as it does now it's very well screwed together indeed decent sized glove box and a little convenient shelf there got central armrest with a cubby in it seats are very comfortable really good lumbar support as well and plenty of adjustment in both the seating position and in the steering wheel it's the nicely designed cabin that competes with all its major rivals. So rear leg room in the back here is fantastic. Plenty of room for those well over six foot. And there's a ton of headroom. I would say you could be six two, six three in the back here with no issues. Moving into the center, still plenty of room. You could fit an adult in here. It's not a completely flat floor, but it's not too far off. You've got a couple of USB charge points down there, a couple of fans and really the quality of all the materials is very nice indeed. So the proof of the pudding with any car really is what it's actually like to drive and live with. And first I have to say that the car's extremely easy to live with. The fact that you've got the petrol engine, the plug-in technology, you can even just charge the car with the petrol engine as you're driving along if you want, gives you ultimate flexibility. One thing that this car does really well that several plug-in hybrids don't is that when you first start the car, it's automatically in EV mode, full EV mode, which means as long as you're keeping the car fairly well charged, whenever you're doing those short commutes, short trips to the shops and things like that, you're always in EV mode. And obviously with a normal petrol car, they're the kind of trips that really eat away at your fuel economy. Now when the car's running in EV mode or hybrid mode, it's a real joy to drive. It just floats along the road, it makes progress effortlessly, it's fantastic. Now what's not quite so good is when that battery power depletes and you're running it purely as a petrol car. It suddenly feels very heavy and uh, 
it, it, it's a completely different driving experience as soon as that battery's drained. But in practice, what you tend to do when the battery drains is stick it onto charging mode for a little while and uh, it's, it's not great for a little while. You put it back into hybrid and it's brilliant. The whole system's very easy to operate and on the screen you've constantly got a display of remaining sort of EV power in miles and remaining petrol power in miles in terms of range. So it's very, very simple and really easy to use. The biggest question I'd be asking myself if I were in your shoes is, is it worth the extra money to have the plug-in hybrid? And a lot of that will depend on your use case. If you really want to use the car as an EV and you do short trips most of the time, but you want to be able to do your family holidays and not have to worry about charging, then possibly the plug-in hybrid makes a bit of sense for you. But financially, it still may not. Depends how cheaply you can charge the car when you're using it as an EV and how regularly you will use it as an EV. Certainly the standard non-plug-in hybrid version of this car is fairly efficient and you really have to think about the financials of any potential fuel savings that you're going to get from having the plug-in version to see if it makes sense for you. I've had the kids in the back of this one a couple of times absolutely no complaints from them and the boot space is fantastic. As I showed you earlier although there are more capacious boots in terms of their official capacity numbers there aren't many that are as easy to use as this or as easy to get large objects in and out of it really is a nice boot. Ride comfort's great despite it being a heavy car, it's really comfortable, like extremely comfortable, especially when you consider the weight of the car. Although in full power hybrid mode this car is very quick at 6 seconds 0-62, uh, nothing about the drive of it makes you want to go and do a lap of the Nürburgring in it, it's not that kind of car. But steering's really quite responsive, but the ride comfort comes first. Now when you compare the car to some of its rivals, I would say by far and away its biggest rival is going to be the Honda CRV. Now, I've recently had a CRV, and uh, I guess the, the question that I should ask myself is would I rather have a RAV4 or a CRV? Well, I'd rather have a RAV4. Funnily enough, the cars share a number of strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it's really odd with them being in such close competition that they seem to have the same little flaws and things. The biggest flaws that you can say in both of them is the infotainment system feels like it's from a different era and the gearbox is not particularly inspiring. For me, the primary thing with car design should be function, um, but after that, it should be interesting. They should make cars as interesting to look at as possible. And this is more interesting to look at. Whether you like it or not, it's a different matter. It is more interesting to look at, I would say, than a Honda CRV. A real-world MPG is very, very difficult to assess in this car because you're just constantly flitting around between different power options. So I haven't been able to measure it in any kind of useful way. What I can tell you is when you run the car as a purely petrol car, uh, you're probably going to get late 30s in terms of its MPG on petrol alone, which considering the size and weight of this vehicle, I don't think is too shabby. So you know the drill by now, I let you know how I feel about these cars going back, and that's sort of how I summarise my feeling towards the car. Well, um, as a family car goes, I'll be quite upset to see this one go back. What I won't be upset to see the back of is the infotainment system, although I'm plugged into Apple CarPlay, every time I get into the car, so it's, it's not as big an issue as I'd probably make out. I should be better at putting things into words sometimes, and I'm just not, but it just dates the car so much. And as soon as you plug in the Apple CarPlay, that's gone, problem solved, great. As for the rest of it, it's just a nice, easy car to live with, really good as a family car, ticks all the boxes in that respect. So for me, the most important things with a car like this, which nine times out of 10 is gonna be used as a big family SUV, is that it's roomy, efficient, and comfortable. And the RAV4 just ticks every one of those boxes. It really does. Now, if you're interested in possibly looking at leasing a RAV4, I'm gonna put a link to Lease Loco in the video description and pinned at the top comment. That will take you through to all the latest deals on RAV4s at the time you're watching this video. Using that link helps support the channel, so thanks in advance. Please give this video a thumbs up and please subscribe if you haven't already done so. Not only do I do lots of car review content on this channel, I do a weekly roundup of all the latest car news and lots of car leasing content and car finance content. Hopefully a bit of something for everyone. Thanks ever so much for watching guys. I'll see you next time.